Hey guys, welcome back to Decently Indecent episode 25. An absolute pleasure to have you joining me here today. I'm going to talk to you guys today about getting lean and feeling the best that you ever has. Coming from somebody who has habitually struggled with their weight, uh, like myself. I want to get down to brass tacks about leaning out, regaining control of your physical body and how it can absolutely transform your life. And I just want to go down a couple rabbit holes too that interests me um, around big food and big pharma because our culture is ultimately set up uh, to make you fail, in my opinion. Now, if you're someone that is happy and healthy and have it figured out, you know, you've, you've got something that works for you and you have it figured out, uh, I'm overjoyed to hear that, first of all. Um, and maybe this episode won't resonate with you, but if you are like me and for the majority of your life have been struggling with maintaining a healthy weight, you've been telling yourself you're going to do something and you just can never figure out a way or find out a way to get there or to do it, then maybe something in this episode will resonate with you because that is that is the culmination, kind of the, the story of my life, quite frankly. You know, as I'm 39 going on 40 next year, I would say currently I'm probably in what is close to the best shape of my life. I might've rivaled it in 2013 in between relationships when I was single and really getting after it hard. But this is a topic that resonates deeply with me because I feel so strongly that it is an absolute pillar that is necessary to build the rest of your life around in a way that that can lead to a positive outcome. And that's, that is just, that is my feeling. That is my opinion. I don't, you know, I, I like to tread, you know, I like to tread, I don't, I'm not going to say tread lightly. I like to be empathetic around this particular topic because I you know we live in a culture now where over 60 70% of the United States is clinically overweight. Children are getting more and more overweight. I mean it is obviously an epidemic. And I mean you can talk about the health implications, the rise of chronic disease, diabetes, like the list is gigantic. Beyond just the physical health implications for me it is it really comes down to the quality of life that you are living. And the fact that if you are not taking care of your temple, literally the thing, the vehicle that enables the entirety of your existence, then it's hard, you know, it's hard to build out and create a beautiful, a beautiful castle when the foundation uh, is crumbling. A little bit paradoxically, I'm going to do a little pour of Jameson out of this um, globe decanter that I love as we discuss this a little bit and get into a couple of these topics, but it's not a paradox at the same time, because, you know, one of, one of my particular tenets is there's extremes in everything that we do. It doesn't matter what that is. It could be people that are addicted to working in business. It's people that are addicted to business. Everything can be taken to an extreme to a point where a good thing can become unhealthy. I've always been an advocate for balance. I think no matter what you're talking about, that is always the ultimate goal is to find a balance that makes sense. And it's no different for me when it comes to trying to stay lean, trying to get in shape, trying to do things that will help my physical health that then helps my mental health that then just creates a better outlook and prognosis for the rest of my life. To expand on the unhealthy part, there's obviously people in the fitness industry that are shredded in 2% body fat. It's their whole life. It's their identity. And I think you can... I mean, very obviously you can take the quote unquote health thing. Like you look at bodybuilders and the fitness people that are doing tons of drugs and they call it the fitness industry, but they're taking it to a level where it's unhealthy, right? You go, all right, you're not unhealthy because you're overweight and eating a lot of dog shit. You're unhealthy because you weigh three, you know, 260 pounds of pure muscle because you're doing 14 grams of X, Y, and Z you know, Mexican pharmaceuticals every week. So there's there's extremes in everything. My basis in life is to find the balance. So as someone who has spent my entire life trying to figure it out for myself, a lot of you have probably heard some of these things somewhere along the way. If you're familiar with any of my content, I've obviously talked about it probably in previous podcasts with my wife. I did an episode almost a year ago on my main channel called 20 Principles, where I talked about a few of the things that have really helped me in the, the the latter years of my 30s. Some of those were fitness related, some were not. This one is obviously more fitness related. But one of the main realizations that I've had in the last couple of years, and I don't think this is going to come to is really much of a surprise to anybody, is that it is wildly profitable for the corporations that have the most influence 
in our country for you to be fat, unhealthy, depressed, and chronically medicated. I'll say it again. It's wildly profitable for you to be fat, unhealthy, depressed, and chronically medicated. Huge money in that. Absolutely insane money. And the crazy part about the pipeline is just kind of the ping pong from big pharma, big food. It's like we make the food cheaper. We make it shittier. We add cheaper ingredients. We fill it with a bunch of chemicals that are kind of like this uh, this gray fox sneaking into the food system that slowly, chronically fucks us. And then on the tail end of that is Big Pharma, who can just continue to come up with these beautiful medications that you can now just take for the rest of your life and create you know, more billion dollar industries. So I want to be clear too up front that I'm not like a I'm not a huge like tinfoil hat guy, right? I understand the necessity and the beauty of modern medicine. In so many ways, if you need a heart transplant, you need like you name it, like there are so many benefits to the healthcare industry. And I'm I'm glad and appreciative for the doctors and the people that spend their lives trying to help people. And I understand the need to try and make food more affordable for people. But this kind of the shitty part about that is I think the the reason we cheapen the food is not to make it more affordable for people, as anyone who's been in a grocery store in the last two months could attest. It's to make more money for the companies making the food, obviously. So again, I'm not a big tinfoil hat conspiracy, conspiracist, but I do feel strongly about following incentives. And what I mean by that is like, when you look at the institutions in our country and the companies and the people that are in roles that are tasked with trying to give the public guidance on how to live healthy lives. You have to look at the incentives for their behavior. And for most of the people, for most of the institutions, it's money. That's their incentive. You could go down this rabbit hole for hours. Things like, you know, the idea that Coke, companies like Coke and Cadbury make massive donations and give grants to the researchers that work for uh, the Diabetes Association that's supposed to give out guidance on how to treat diabetes. There, You know what I mean? There's things like this. And I, I'm not going to know the names of all the associations. I'm not a fucking scholar, right? But these things are well-documented. It is the lobbyists and the companies that are the biggest in the world, in the country, figure out back doors in ways to influence not only the products and the public perception in the media, but the science and the research so much of it is bought and paid for. So all that is to say is there is nobody, in my opinion, <laughs> disseminating information through the normal pipelines of these kind of trusted institutions that is doing it because they care about your health. It is an entire system built to create profitability for the companies that pay for the research and pay for all of the shit that is being put into the grocery stores that is making people fat, sick, and depressed. So there's that piece of it. It's not just the fact that the ingredients in food have changed drastically over the last 20 or 30 years. It's obviously lifestyle, self-control, people's inability to feel hunger without freaking out, you know, just lack of self-awareness and willingness to not face this type of thing head on. Some people are totally fine with it and that's okay as well. But I don't know, you know, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers and telling anyone how they have to live. But I will say this, I don't know a single person on fucking earth that has been heavy, unhealthy and felt shitty and depressed that went through a physical transformation, beat themselves into the dirt, went through the pain of change to find a new normal and wasn't a completely different person at the end of it. You can't find me a person that's lost 30, 40, 50 pounds, gotten healthy and was like, nah, not happy I did that. I'm just going to go back to being, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't exist. This is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a fitness guru or one of these guys that has the desire to, you know, create like an Instagram page and like do all these workouts and stuff. I feel very strongly about it for myself because of how much it's affected my life in, in the ways in which I've had some successes and been able to figure some things out for me that have really really helped me live a better life. And it makes me want to talk about it. Frankly, you know, quite frankly, it just, it makes me want to say it. And I, I, I feel, I always get so self-conscious about sounding preachy 
or being on a soapbox, excuse me, because that's not what I want to sound like. It's more like, hey, this is fucking awesome. And if you're in a place where you're really struggling, this can probably be awesome for you too. I know it could be awesome for you too. And if you don't know how to take the first step, maybe one of these things can be that for you. It's just someone that's like excited about something and wants to share it. So, and again, I'm not like, I'm not some sort of PhD scholar, like the Lane Norton's and like the Andrew Huberman's. I'm just a, like, I'm just a normal dude, college educated. I do have a degree in exercise science, which was not really nutrition related, but most of the things I've learned in the trial and error has just quite frankly been bro science in trying shit on myself and figuring it out. We can get into some of the specifics, but I just, I think the realization is, is just the idea that our culture is set up for us to fail. There is nobody out there besides you that actually gives a shit about your health. You are a number on a balance sheet. I mean, the rabbit holes are deep, man. When you talk about food and, and pharmaceuticals in this country and how, you know, it's, it's like fucking yin and yang, man. It, we, we get people fat, sick, and depressed, and then we, we get them chronically medicated to, to, deal with their, to deal with these sicknesses and these symptoms that could be solved without the medication if people just had the right guidance. But when they go to doctors, when people go into doctors, this is a fucked up statistic, and I might not say it exactly right, but when you talk about Prognosis, prognoses and patients that are going in, patients that are chronically ill and have diseases and things that need to be dealt with, you would think the metric for success would be how can we reverse these diseases or reverse these health complications with these patients without medications? Can we get them exercising? Can we get them eating better? Can we get them going on walks, getting sunlight, sleeping better? Can we do these things? And maybe they might recommend that. But that isn't the metrics for success. The metric for success is, are they taking their medication, right? If you look, and I've, I was just reading an article recently from uh, an ex-Stanford uh, physician, Stanford-trained physician who was a physician for years, and she left, the, she left the practice because she was just so disenfranchised with how it was run, how it's such, it's such big business that we, that, you know, these offices aren't making money from people that are reversing diseases by doing healthy things. They're making money by treating these diseases with medications that they stay on for the rest of their life. There is no incentive for you to be a healthy American. Nobody makes money from that except you. <laughs> You're the only one that benefits from that. Physical health, exposure to nature and natural light and stress management are literally the most potent antidepressants on the planet. And guess what? The first two on that list are both incredible ways to manage stress. I'm not going to sit here and say that there aren't people that need pharmaceutical intervention when it comes to some of these things I'm talking about, like depression, et cetera. I'm not educated enough to know these things. I know there are some people that have benefited greatly and have had a need for pharmaceutical intervention and it has turned their life around and it's been wonderful. But I also am of the belief that the flip side of that is just what I'm talking about, just what I said previously, where when people go to get treated, they are not being steered in a direction that helps treat the root causes of their issues. They are just being medicated. They're putting a Band-Aid on an infection and not just in treating the infection, right? And I'm generalizing right now. I, again, I just feel that there are so many people that could completely turn their life around without the need for pharmaceutical intervention by changing a few of their daily habits. I truly do. And I say that as somebody who has done those things, somebody who has <clears throat> come from uh, a family history of high blood pressure and, and, and high cholesterol and uh, diabetes and have spent most of my life trying to figure out how to not go on that thing. That is one of the things I'm most proud of is at somebody who is 40 now, I, and don't get me wrong. I've, you know, I went through phases where I was like, oh shit, my blood pressure was getting high, but I was always so averse to just going on a medication because I'm like, I just wanted to, I got, there's gotta be a way to treat this without just having to take something to treat it. And I know like there's the lesser of two evils, right? It's like, well, if you don't take the medication and you don't treat the root problem and take care of your health, yeah, you probably are going to die young and you probably should have taken the medication if you want to live longer. But for me, it was always like the human body is resilient. It is smart. It is a fucking brilliant, brilliant machine. 
And if you just figure out a way and learn how to give it some of what it wants, it can, it can heal itself and it can be a wonderful, like it is so receptive and responsive to giving it things that it likes and loves. And I realize the irony of me saying that while I'm sipping a glass of whiskey, again, we talk about moderation, but uh, yeah, for me, like the, the latest run for me, a lot of you that have, that are familiar with me and my wife have seen the last four or five years of us and the, in the, the journey we've been on with our health and losing a bunch of weight, my wife losing over 50, 60 pounds. She's just turned into a new person, you know, she, and she was the type of woman, she was the type of woman who was never, never went to gym, never worked out, didn't have the, it was just kind of just too nervous and intimidated by it. And once she f- figured out, I, I don't even, I don't even want to, I want to, I don't want to call it like figure out, figuring out a way. It was like, once she committed to, to just being consistent at the exercise piece and starting to track and, and be more aware of what she's putting in her body. And you go through the pain of that initial inertia change, which is always the hardest part. She found this kind of incredible new life on the other side of that. And she's so infatuated and all in on it that she can't, it's hard for her to even imagine how she was, you know, four years ago, which has been awesome and wild to see. And, you know, she's been such an inspiration to me too, as somebody who's so different from her in the sense that I've been really self-aware and dealing with this my whole life. Like I've always been to the gym. I was always that guy that worked out. I've never had a problem getting big and strong. I've always been big and strong. I'm a tall guy. I'm naturally endomorphic. So I'm able to put on muscle, but for me, it's always just been this real genetic predisposition to carry a lot of weight. So doing any sort of leaning out has just is always, it takes a lot of, a lot of discipline. And I think that was always my problem was I always just thought, well, I'm working out, you know, I'm athletic. I play sports, I'm working out. So I'm healthy. And it gives you this, it kind of gives you this false sense of security to allow you to just eat whatever you want. You know, you just, you don't, you you I don't really have to pay attention as long as I'm eating enough protein, you just aren't paying attention. But the, the, the unfortunate reality is. And it took me a long time to come to terms with this. I've always kind of known it, but it's like the working out piece is obviously important, but there is nothing that even comes close to being as important as what you put into your body and how much you put into your body. Again, it's more, for me, it's more of a volume thing than it is a what it is thing. They're both, they're both important. You know, you can avoid seed oils and you can avoid everything processed. You can eat all whole foods and nature grown you know, only food that Jesus has touched with his dick tip, you know, organic grown from the fucking grasses of heaven. You can eat all that stuff and that's wonderful. You're going to be healthier for it, but it's also, it's a volume. It's a volume problem as well. And, you know, you can talk about the fact that, you know, processed foods versus whole foods. It's way easier by design to overeat processed foods because they're, they're just engineered to be hyper palatable into not be satiating and fulfilling. So I like, I can eat a whole fucking adult sized bag of Doritos and it makes you feel shitty, but it doesn't fill me up. You know, it, it's fucking 2000 calories makes me feel terrible and doesn't even really fill me. Or I can eat like an 800 calorie meal of delicious whole foods, grains, veggies, potatoes, steak, chicken, fucking shrimp, seafood, fruit, feel like a million fucking bucks filled to the tits, super full, nutrient dense. It's just so important. And, and again, to, to, to my wife's credit, she does an awesome job bringing some whole foods into the house and cooking, but we have a healthy balance. Listen, I talk about all this shit in the center of the, you know, all this process stuff, kind of the middle, in the middle of the grocery store, the, uh, the processed foods, the foods that come in boxes, the cereals, the, the preserves, the preservatives, et cetera, et cetera. It's really difficult, especially when you have kids or you're, you have a family to avoid all of that stuff completely. And we don't, you know, we have some of that stuff in the house. We eat chips. I eat veggie straws. You know, we eat things that are made by Monsanto and big pharma, but we're cognizant and self-aware of how much of that we're putting into our body. And we make a concerted effort to make sure that the majority of our calories and the food we get are from good sources. And that's important. You don't have to be perfect. You just need to be aware and to make an effort. That is it. So let me give you a quick rundown of what my days look like most of the time as I've started to to whittle down and figure out a, a, a lifestyle that has worked really well for me in the last couple of years as I've gotten to a place where I feel very comfortable 
where I'm at weight wise. Like I'd be happy to be here. I'm, I want to continue to get leaner just for the sake of it. Cause I never have been, like I said, I've always been a heavier guy. I've never been treaded or whatever. So I just want to see how far I can push it <laughs> as an almost 40 year old, but I would be totally okay. If I could just stay at two, I'm at 240, which is what I'm at right now, uh, out right now, I weigh 240 pounds, relatively muscular. I strength train three times a week. And then I just move my body as much as possible. The other days, walking steps. I mean, walking is literally the most underrated activity of all time for weight loss, just moving your body. In my days look like this. I wake up most mornings and uh, I fast in the morning, typically. I delay breakfast. I think a lot of people wake up with this feeling of hunger, right? What you think is hunger. I think oftentimes it's your body just probably being a little dehydrated. And for that reason, I drink a little bit of electrolyte water in the morning. Uh, there's a bunch of different brands, or you can do it yourself. It's basically just like sodium and potassium or predominant pieces. I use a, a company called Element, LMNT. They sent me some shit. I'm not sponsored by them. I just like their flavors. I fill up a 40 ounce Stanley, put some electrolytes on that shit. And after I've had a couple sips of that, maybe six, eight, 10 ounces, all of a sudden the hunger starts to subside. It's like, all right, I'm starting to rehydrate a little bit. Not really that hungry. Depending on the time of morning, I'll oftentimes have a coffee. Sometimes I'll have it black. Sometimes I'll have it with some milk. I don't really consider the milk much of breaking a fast. But for me, one of the things that has worked the best is just kicking the can down the road as far as calorie consumption. I have a, a general loose idea of how many calories I need or kind of a window of where I want to be to get to the goals that I want, which is whether to be in a deficit or to be at maintenance. Um, most of the time it's to be in a deficit because I'm always kind of battling that. And I, like I said, I, I really don't have much trouble putting on size. And I say this to someone, I'm not, you know, like a bodybuilder type of guy, but I'm a, just, uh, I'm as big as, I, I have no desire to really be bigger than I am right now. I would love to just be able to stay a little bit leaner year round. So I just put off breakfast. I just kicked the can down the road. Intermittent fasting, so to speak, you know, the 16, eight type of beat. And then around whatever it is, sometimes 12, sometimes one, sometimes it's 11, 1130. If I start to get hungry, I have my lunch. When it comes to meals, protein, just eat, just figure out what your protein's gonna be and then work around that. Super simple, that's it. You go out to a fucking cafe and order like cheese fries, zero protein, saturated fat, fry, like just takes a little bit out. You just got to start thinking about these things, you know? Like I get it. Those are good. It's delicious. It's comfortable. It feels good. But I'm telling you, like when you can get out of the habit of just unconsciously eating the most palatable shit at all times, your body gets used to it and your body starts to really love and crave foods that make you feel good in my experience. And I still get the, we, I still get the fucking cravings. Me and my wife, I call it the CPSs, Right. That the chicken parm subs, like they'll be like, she'll know. Like if I'm, I'm having a day where I'm like, I can't, I'm so fucking hungry. I just, I just can't get satiated. I'm so hungry. I just want to eat it. I just want to eat like an extra large chicken parm sub. So I'll tell her, I'll be like, honey, I got the CPSs tonight. She's like, oh boy, here we go. And occasionally I'll indulge that and I'll have something. I'll be like, you know what? I've been doing pretty well. Let's fucking get after it. Let's eat a little bit more today. Let's have something we like. Let's have a treat, whatever it is. But that's the exception more so than the norm. I'm not just every time I'm feeling a little bit of hunger, like, oh, I have to eat. I'm hungry. That's some real fucking, that's some real grade school shit, right? You need to retrain your brain to realize that like your body feeling hunger sometimes is a good signal because it means, oh shit, it's your body crying. Like, oh no, you're not going to make me use this fucking stored body fat as fuel. Are you, you absolute prick? How fucking dare you? I'm so used to you just throwing food down your gullet every time I give you the first twinge of hunger, you absolute dickhead. You know what I'm saying? Like your body gets used to it. Oh, I'm hungry. I have to eat. No, bitch. No, you don't. <laughs> your body is incredibly resourceful. And I promise you, even when you think you're not eating that much, you probably are if you haven't tracked your calories before. Everything in our society is built and geared to keep you full of calories at all times. 700, 800 calorie Starbucks drinks fast food, like you fucking name it. You have to make an effort. You have to be cognizant. You need a little bit of awareness about what's in these foods that you're putting in your body or that shit is just going to day after day, month after month, and then five, six, eight, seven, ten, nine, thirteen 10, 9, 13 years go by and holy fuck, what happened? And I get it. I've been there. 300 plus, hot damn.
Where did that come from? Because you don't know. You're just in the mix of it. You're in the throes of your relationship, your marriage, you have kids, you got a family. Like everything in our culture and our society is geared around food. Every get together, every holiday, every celebration, every get together with the boys, we're drinking booze, like all of this shit. Everything we do is based around consumption. Everything. Even with my wife, like when my kid's getting... We get a night off because he goes to his he goes to his his grandmother's house. My wife and I are like, "What is there anything we can is there anything we can do that isn't just like eating a two thousand calorie dinner out or drinking or it's like well it's tough that's like most people's social life is based around consumption that's the nature of it so you got to make some concessions you got to figure a couple things out it takes a little bit of work it does and it's especially hard if you have a partner or a wife because there's almost this unspoken ableism that happens between both parties. And I say that in a loving way. That was my wife and I four or five years ago, hundred percent. And ableism is kind of fucking sounds like a weird progressive word. I don't typically use, but it is, it's kind of this unspoken, like, yeah, we, the, you just, it's easy to fall into this comfort zone of we're stressed out. The kids take so much of our energy. Oh God, they're in bed. All we want to, all I can think about is sitting down to relax and watch Netflix and we eat and food is, food is your comfort. And oftentimes either the wife or the husband loves to cook the comfort food. And the next thing you know, you're cranking four, five, 6,000 calories a day without thinking twice about it. And you wake up when you're 35, 40 and you're like, holy fucking shit. Holy shit. All I can say to that is I, I, I understand that I'm there. It's so easy to fall into that. And I don't have a good solution for how to approach that with a partner or a spouse. If you're at that point where you like, you really want to change a couple of these daily habits, I just hope that for you, that your partner is at least supportive. It doesn't mean they have to do it too, but it is a lot harder to start to steer the ship in a different direction when there's two people steering it for sure. And I understand that. And that's why I consider myself very lucky and blessed that my wife took the initiative that she did without my behest. I always had my own journey. I never pressured her to do anything, but I'd be lying if I said that her tenacity and unbelievable discipline has not been an incredible example and made my life easier. Not only because she helps cook a lot of the food, but just as an example, it's like, well, I'm shit. I got to keep up with this broad now. God damn. You know what I mean? Like, so there's a wonderful synergy that can happen from that. And I don't have the the solutions. I don't know. every Everybody's relationship is different. If you're single, it's a whole different story. I mean, there's obviously always the meme that people that like, you know, someone gets out of a long, unhealthy relationship and it's like they drop 60 pounds. They're happy as they've ever been. You know, there's, there's a lot of variables. I get it. There's a lot of variables. But a couple of the things are absolutes, which is being self-aware of what you're putting in your body and just making sure you're active. And that's pretty much it. So let me finish with my day. I, I, I got sidetracked after I said the pro, protein centric focus. I have lunch. I, I pick a protein. Sometimes we have leftovers, chicken, taco meat. Sometimes I will have a protein shake, a little bit of snack food. I usually keep my lunch relatively light, just enough to get me through the dinner. And then this is when I really, dinner time comes. I've probably had four, five, 600, maybe 700 calories. And I'm ready to eat, maybe. I'm ready to feast. And I don't have to really think that hard about what I'm eating at dinner because the foods are typically good. We're eating whole foods, we're eating fish, we're eating steak, we're eating chicken, we're eating potatoes, we're eating veggies, we're eating some good shit. And I'm not weighing it on the scale. I'm not portioning it out because I've, I got a lot of calories to spare for the day, baby. I love my dinner. I'm hungry as a motherfucker. I want to eat and I eat until I'm full as shit. And then a couple hours go by. I'll sometimes just have a snack like an hour or two after dinner. Like we'll be sitting on the couch before Jackson's getting ready to go to bed. I'll fill up a bowl of grapes, you know, and just have a little snack food, like some grapes, a little bit of light popcorn, something just to, just to nibble on. And then he goes down around 8, 8.30. I'll have pretty much my third and final meal, quote unquote meal. Again, what's my protein? Some nights it'll be a 60, 70 gram protein shake where I'm doing like scoop and a half away, half a cup of Greek yogurt, some banana, whatever the hell, a little bit of frozen fruit in there. Other nights it'll be some cottage cheese and berries. Other nights, it'll be some chicken. One of the kind of gray areas I will talk about as I've, I've as I've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, processed foods and these things you find in package, packaged foods and things that aren't whole foods. There, there is the new trend is you know protein artificially protein rich snack foods, Quest chips, dessert bars that have twelve grams of protein, like. That's like the new marketing thing. It's like what organic was in the early 2000s. It's what's it's what low fat was in the 90s. It's like, oh, hey, here's this 
here's this thing, but now it has more protein in it, right? And like, we're guilty of doing that because we are of the mindset. Like I'm trying to get 70 grams a meal easily. I'm doing, I'm trying to do at least 50 to 70. My rule of thumb is to try and break 200 calories of protein a day. And to do that in, in three meals is not always easy. Sometimes I'll supplement with a little beef jerky or something like that, but I'm usually getting it done. And so, yeah, we have the Fair Life milks. We got the chocolate. We got like the single serve ones. We got the big quarts that are the regular milk. We have uh, the hyper, the protein rich Greek yogurts. We have the Quest chips, just other shit, little shit with protein in it. And I'm okay with that. I'm not pumped about it because I know what I'm eating is like made in a fucking lab, probably just as bad as having Doritos, but at least you're having Doritos with some whey protein in them. <laughs> but again, it's moderation. I'm not getting most of my protein from that. It's just a supplement to mostly whole foods that are filling me up because I'm, you know, because I'm working out hard. I'm getting a lot of activity. I'm moving around a lot. I need that protein for my body to recover. Um, so that's it. My last meal at 830. And then that's it. We'll do whatever, play some video games. I'll go to the office. I'll work some. I'll get back to the house. I don't know, I'll go to bed 12, 1 o'clock. I'll take my vitamins, a little magnesium, go to sleep on an empty stomach, which honestly is better for your sleep. You will sleep better if you aren't trying to digest food. If you're like cranking, you know, 1,000 calories of snacks and going to bed, your body's just not pumped about that. And I will say, full disclosure, my, my biggest weakness and one of the things I've always been, and again, I've spoken about this before at various times on, on my channels, late night eating was always my biggest vice. I would say if there was one thing that was the, the hardest thing for me to snap, it was the get done with work. It's been a long day. The wife and kid are in bed. Before I have to go to bed and wake up and do it all over again, I want to unwind and go sit on the couch at like, 12.30 or 1 a.m. and just watch a show and mindlessly crank fucking poison out of the snack cabinet. And when I'm off the wagon, when I'm struggling, when I'm not feeling it, and this happens. I mean, you know, I I lost a weight. I lost a bunch of weight in 2020. Roller coaster a little bit, went up and down because I, it is it is something I struggle with. I am an emotional eater. Food has always been an escape for me. It's been a, a, a running theme in my family since I was a kid. My whole family's always struggled with their weight. All of us have always made an effort and sometimes we fail and sometimes we do great. And it's just a blessing that we've, we've all continued to understand that it's important. So we never completely give up, but emotional eating is a, is a, that's huge. And I understand if you're listening right now and you're like, oh yeah, it's, this sounds great. On paper, right? I guess the I, what I'm trying to say is on paper, it's not that hard. You could write down what you eat in a day. This is how many calories I want. You write it down. That's what I got to do. Here's the plan for the week. Boom. No problem. Easy peasy. It's not that difficult. On paper, it is not hard to lose weight. You eat less calories than you consume. You're active. You work out. Walk some more. Eat X amount of calories a day. Your body will burn fat for fuel. It is about as basic as it gets. So much easier said than done. I am completely empathetic to the nature of comfort eating because it has been probably my biggest vice in my life. I've never struggled with drugs. I enjoy drinking responsibly, but I've never struggled with constantly binge drinking on a regular basis to a point where it negatively affects my life. I occasionally, a couple times a year, will go out and maybe go a little bit too hard during a special occasion. Food has always been my vice. And I know that a lot of people can relate to that. And it's not demonized like drugs and alcohol are because food is a necessity. We have to have food. It is the substance. It is how we subsist as humans. We must consume and eat and drink, but we do it in such excess now. It is the definition of too much of a good thing. And so finding a, finding a way to reel that back in to a place that is a little bit more ancestral, right? When you didn't have 6,000 options everywhere you went, you know, it was a little bit more feast and famine, <laughs> a little bit more, let your body be hungry for a while. It's engineered to not need food every two hours, every three hours, every four hours. You can be fine for a day without food. Your body can figure it out. And the big picture is just over the course of a week, how many calories did you burn? How much did you move your body and how much did you put in it? It's that fucking easy. But in our in this culture we live in, in our society, again, that is engineered for us to be a statistic, for us to be profitable for these companies, it is very difficult unless we are taking intentional steps to be self-aware about what we're doing. And I guess 
the whole point of what I'm trying to say is I have no right telling anybody how to live their life, but I can sit here and tell you that there is no question that I am a completely different person in the best way possible when I am physically and emotionally in, in tune with myself, taking care of my body, indulging in things I like, but doing it responsibly. And when I get to that point where it's like, uh, I'm starting to spiral and I do, and it'll happen again. You'll see me probably. I don't know. I said at the beginning of this podcast, this is probably close to the best shape I've ever been in. I'm going into the winter time, which is traditionally for me the hardest time. And if you're from New England, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, it's funny too. Like last end of last summer was, I was in really good shape too, because like summer sunlight, I'm outside, I'm golfing, I'm walking, I'm enjoying the weather. I'm just moving around. I'm happy. And then the winter hits and it gets dark at 4 PM and I get seasonal depression. And where do I turn to comfort myself? I start eating food. I start staying up later. I start eating snack food on the couch. So that's my, that's my battle going into this winter is how can I continue the momentum I have from the summer and be able to have the discipline through the winter to get me through the shitty, dark, cold fucking New England winter without completely abandoning these things that have made me feel so great and given me motivation for life and to continue thriving in other areas of my life. How can I not abandon those and just go back to these old habits because when it gets a little dark early and it's cold out now, you know what I mean? Like it's, that's my struggle and that struggle is for me. And I know some of you guys can relate. There's part of me that wishes I just I just want to up and move to like Florida or San Diego. I can't I can't imagine living in a sunshine state where you you can just walk out any day of the year with your shirt off and go down to the beach and like god damn, bro. That must be amazing. But my life is in New England. I grew up here. My family's here. So I got to figure it out for myself. And everybody, I, and you know, I understand how unique everyone's situation is. Of course, there's so many elements to the puzzle, so many pieces to the puzzle, you know? And there's, ex some of them are pieces. Some of them are legitimate. Most of the time it's excuses. Oh, I don't have time. I don't have the money. I can't afford a gym. Like there's every excuse in the book, no matter what. If it's a priority, I don't care what class you're from, how much money you have, how many jobs you work, how many kids you have. If you want to, you can make it a priority, full stop, if you want to. But most people just prefer the excuses because that's way fucking easier than getting the inertia, figuring out how to get up the inertia to change something. Yeah, if you're lifting, moving a lot, eating relatively clean and sleeping well, and you're not seeing any results, you're just eating too many calories. Barring some sort of fringe thyroid issue. Like, I know that's the other piece people are, oh, well, it's, it's genetic. There was, there was an article, God, this, oh, there was an actual interview with like one of these fucking quote unquote doctors who's supposed to be, you know, who's supposed to be a lead, a thought leader on whatever the fuck. I don't know, but she sat up there and gave an interview on some MSNBC, some fucking news network. And was like, the whole the whole point of the interview is basically obesity is completely genetic and there's really nothing you can do about it. And if you are fat, it's, I'm sorry, you shouldn't even try. Like it was, it was, it was one of the most un insane things I've ever seen. But she sat there and with a straight face was like, oh yeah, it's just, yeah, if you're fat, it's just genetic. There's really nothing you can do. And oh, I was just blown away. And I, I like, I understand that there's obviously genetic piece. There's a genetic piece. Some people are naturally lean. Some people have a propensity to hold more weight, but the human body is still the human body and energy is still energy. And your body, your body cannot store energy that you don't consume. It's that simple. That is just, unfortunately, life isn't fair. It's much harder for some people than it is for others. There's no question. That is a cold, hard reality of life. Quality doesn't exist right? Everything is, is on some sort of scale. Some people have some things easier than others. There's some people that are very smart. There's some people that have fucking 60 IQ. It's just the way life is. And we can try and pretend all day that that's not fair and scream and pout, but it really only comes down to like, Hey, this is my situation. How am I going to make this better? And if you have to work twice as hard to get a quarter of the results as your neighbor who eats cheesecake and like fucking doesn't even think about what he eats and he has a six pack. I'm so sorry. 
You can fucking spend your whole life being mad at your neighbor, or you can figure out how you can do something to better your own life. Like that, that's my philosophy. That's kind of how I view things. There were times certainly where I would get angry. I'm like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm really doing great. I'm working hard. And like, I used to have this Greek friend in high school, one of my good friends, Chris, he's this Greek dude, big old Dumbo ears, fucking one of the best dudes I know, but he was just nat, just naturally ripped. The dude was like his family owned a pizza shop, not stereotypical Greek at all. <laughs> and he would just eat fucking ham subs and pizza all day long, just grease fucking subs with extra mayo, like 6% body fat all through high school. And we would just like, we'd always, ra we, we'd always rag on each other. And he would like, he'd come up to me and like grab my belly and pinch my fat belly. Like when I'm playing World of Warcraft and I would, you know, it was all good fun, but those things too. I, I remember there was times where I'd be, I think I internalized that and got a little jaded. I'm like, why is this motherfucker? Like, doesn't, doesn't think twice about what he does. Ripped as a motherfucker and I'm, I'm fat ass bitch and I'm actually trying, you know, that's the reality of life. And the fucked up part is it took me, you know, 20 years. Well, I shouldn't say this. I've lost weight. I've gained weight about a billion times, but I never stopped trying. And I finally got to the point where I stopped getting mad. I stopped getting upset that it was maybe harder for me than it was for other people. It's just genetics, man. It's life. So God, I, there, in so many ways, I won the fucking lottery. There's a lot worse things than being uh, a little bit predisposed to being heavier, right? So it was kind of a reality check where I was like, I can't believe I'm actually moping around and mad about this, man. I'm super blessed. And I just got to figure out, I just got to figure out what I got to do for myself and did it. So I love talking about this stuff. I've gone a little bit off the rails here. You know, I didn't have a, a particular script I wanted to follow. This is more just a anecdotal experience and something I'm passionate about because I just think there's a lot of pain and mental unwellness that could be remedied and reversed with a little bit of self-awareness and cognizance around some of the things I talked about today. And I just think it, it can't be stressed enough how much of a system our bodies are. Our bodies are connected. It is a machine. So you can't expect one part of the machine to be decrepit and run down and, for, and think that the other parts are going to work well. It's all interconnected, right? You can't drive a car with no engine. Even if all the other parts of the car work great, the shocks, the tires, the struts, the spark plugs are all tip top brand new. If that engine's fucked up, and is not getting taken care of, that car's not going fucking anywhere. That's exactly how I feel about the human body. If you don't take care of your fucking body, your brain starts to shit the bed, everything else starts to shit the bed, it affects every fucking part of your life. So just start with the physical, find new habits, get into a place where you can do these things consistently, get the inertia to where the pain of the change turns into something that feels like a new normal. And once you get to that point, then... All bets are off, man. There's nothing you can't fucking do. There's absolutely nothing you can't do. So if you're feeling stuck, you're feeling low, like you're on this Ferris wheel of pain and you have no idea how to get off of it, it's within your reach. It's always within your reach to get off of it, even if that feels unimaginable at this point in time. It's a single choice today, tomorrow, and the next day to do some of the things uh, you know you could do better to lead a healthier life physically and mentally. And it's just about having the balls and the grit to endure that pain of change until it becomes the new normal. And before you know it, you'll look back and wonder how you ever lived like you used to, right? That's <laughs> that's what you hear a lot of the times from people that are eventually make the, they're like they're, they're like, man, how did I, God, I can't imagine. How did I ever do that? I don't know. That's my two cents today. I don't know if any of this made sense or resonated with you, but it is something I feel strongly about. So I like talking about it because it reaffirms it for me. And I hope that if one or two or three people can hear my fervor when I talk about this and how important it is to me, that that can tingle or flip a tiny little switch in them that could be the catalyst that helps them make a positive change in their life, whatever that might be. I hope you're doing well. And I appreciate you so much for listening and taking the time to be here with me today. And I'm looking forward to talking with you again next week. Have a good one. Peace.